Okay, good morning, everyone. Hey, yeah, question. Okay, why don't we control the, uh, the question is for level control, this was uh, in Friday's lecture, so I'm just uh, recapping this example and, and using it to add some more theory for today's class. But uh, from the question from Brandon there is, why do we control this valve position here? Uh, let's call this V3. Why do I control that valve position instead of controlling the pump? Any comments on that? Anyone who's had an experience with that? So, yeah, Kim. Okay. Okay, so uh, there was another hand, no? Uh, so the VFD that Kim is referring to, variable frequency drive, is a drive that can change the speed of the motor to adjust the pump flow. That's an expensive piece of, of equipment to purchase, whereas a valve is relatively inexpensive. Um, so let's, uh, let's re recap what we had here last class. Uh, we had a lot of discussion around this diagram, and the key idea of Friday's class was flexibility. And I said flexibility was a way that we can steer or move the process. No different to driving a car. In this process, we have three things we would like to move or steer around. One is the flow rate coming in. The second is the level on the, um, on the tank over there. And then the third is the temperature. So those three variables we'd like to move independently of each other. Much the same way when you're driving your car, you'd like to control the speed of the car independently from the position, right? You don't want the position of the car on the highway to be affecting the speed and vice versa. So the same thing with the process. If we're making changes to the flow, we don't necessarily want the temperature to be upset or the level to be upset. In this particular tank, if we need to change the flow inlet, we can see this intuitively. If we change this flow inlet, let's say the operator dials in a new set point. Instead of 1,000 tons per hour, the operator wants 1,200 tons per hour. This feedback controller for level is automatically going to adjust because now when we add more flow to the tank, we also now have to remove flow at a faster rate in order to keep the level constant. So that's a, an achievable controller um, goal. And I wanted to just talk a little bit more about how we make those decisions. It's a recap essentially of some topics from 3P. You'll recall the terminology of a relative gain array okay, and a process gain matrix. Let's understand what those mean again, um, because we're going to have to use that in our careers. So uh, let's uh, label some valves here. I've called that V1. We could call this one V2 over here, for example, and call that V3 over there. And we can then create a relative um, gain matrix as follows. We set up our three controller outputs. Let's uh, do them in the order there. We'd like to control the flow, we would like to control the temperature, and I would like to control the level. And the question is, if I manipulate valve position V1, V2, V3, what is the effect going to be on those corresponding three outputs? Okay, so many, uh, two people asked me after the class on Friday, how did you know that that was a better controller configuration? Okay. And the answer is, comes from the relative gain array, which you learned about in, in 3P. So let's see where this relative gain array let's, uh, is derived from. We, f we start off when we need a steady state gain matrix. So take a look at this diagram here on the left. Um, I just want you to pay attention to this because this is critical to understanding what we're doing next. Take this diagram on the, on the left and assume we get to steady state. The very definition of steady state is that everything is constant over time. If I look at the process now and I look at the process a minute later, they look identical. So if the process is at steady state, it means we've got no deviations, no changes occurring, I can go delete all those orange lines. All those control loops can disappear. Okay? And for another few minutes, the process will keep operating as is. Okay, so when you're operating at steady state, this is an important insight. You don't actually need control. Remember when we started the class on Friday, I drew you a flow diagram with no control loops on it, and we came to the, the, the understanding that that's a rigid process. It can operate at one single operating point. We can't steer or move it to a new operating point. In order to move a process from one point to another is why you need control loops. 
is to steer your process. You also need control loops to counteract disturbances. But let's assume we've got no disturbances and we're making no changes to the process. We don't need to steer it anywhere. I could actually take all those orange lines away. And that's what we call an open loop process. So that terminology is familiar from 3P. So we now have an open loop process, no orange lines. Let me ask you this question then. If I change val V1 and I open it by 10% more, so I'm opening V1 a little bit more, what's going to happen to flow? F. This is not a trick question. I go increase, OK? If I change valve position V1, what's going to happen to temperature, T? Everything is fixed, right? I've taken away all my control loops. In other words, the valves stay where they are. The only valve I'm changing is I'm telling you, I'm asking what's happening if I open V1 a little more. What's going to happen to temperature? Up, down, stay the same. Decrease, okay? So it decreases, and the way we can see that is if I'm putting more flow into this tank, this level is rising, there's more material to be heated. So this heat that's coming in, this valve position V2 does not change. So I'm spreading that heat around through more material. So the net temperature in the tank drops. It's negative. What happens to the level if I open V1? Increases, okay? Because when I open V1, I'm telling you I'm only changing V1. I'm leaving V2, V3 as is. So if V3 stays where it is and I open V1, that level must go up. That fluid must go somewhere. Okay, this is why process control is so critical. We have to have this intuitive understanding of how these loops are going to behave and interact. Now let's go to V2. Okay, so I've done V1. Let's take a look at what happens with V2. Let's put V1 back at its original position. It's at steady state, and I open V2 by 10%. What's going to happen to flow, F? Plus, minus, or zero? Zero, okay. If I open V2, what's going to happen to temperature? It goes up. We're using steam over there. Let's presume that this is a steam heating coil. So open V2, more steam goes through the coils, the temperature goes up. What happens to the level if I open V2? Okay. If you open valve V2, it simply adds more steam in, and the steam just passes through, but it doesn't affect the level in any way. Okay. Let's take valve V3. Open V3, does it affect the flow F? Zero, okay. Open V3, what is the effect on temperature? Up, yeah, everyone see that, up? Okay, so you open that valve V3, you get an increase in temperature because you now have less material in the tank to heat, so that heat goes through less material, the overall temperature rises. And V3's effect on level Plus, minus, zero, minus, okay. So what we see there is a few zeros and we get some non-zeros. That matrix there, that three by three matrix, we call K, okay. And if I had a numeric model for the system, which is easy to do, and in Aspen or with um, uh, ODEs, you can get that, that model coefficients. You'd need to know a bit more about your heat transfer coefficients and your reaction is going on there. But K is a matrix that you can calculate. And then your RGA is calculated from K, the element, element product of K inverse transpose. Okay. And You'll recall that equation and how we use it from 3P is that we look at the elements in RGA and we find 
entries that are close to one, and those are the loops that we pair, pair on. Okay. So in this case, what you'll find is that the element in RGA corresponding to V1 and F is close to one, or it, is, it will be one, will be one and close to one. And so that's why these three loops are found. Okay, so we can do pairing on an intuition basis, but that is the appropriate way to do pairing from 3P4. So I, I gave you a sense of the intuition basis in Friday's class. For example, I had asked you, why don't we control temperature using this flow? Okay, and we had that intuition that that's not really a suitable manipulated variable to control temperature. For one, the change in time between making a change here in V1 and seeing an effect on T is, is long. Okay? That's one reason why we wouldn't pair on it. Um, but the RGA is a systematic approach we can follow for pairing, um, for pairing our loops. Okay, this system has what we call one-way interaction. Um, one-way interaction is just a way of saying that a variable will affect the others, but the others don't affect that variable. The clearest example of that is flow affects temperature and affects level. We see that over here. The flow rate, when I adjust V1, I open and close that valve, I get more or less flow. It affects, of course, flow, but it also affects temperature and it affects level. Okay? But the other two valves, V2, for temperature and V3 for level, neither of those affect flow. Okay, so it's a one-way interaction, and it makes logical sense. It's further upstream, right? So you can't get your flow really coming back to, uh, so you can't get your level coming back around at you and affecting flow. You can't get temperature coming back at around you and affecting flow either. So it's a one-way interaction. So that's a term that we see, and we like one-way interaction because that helps um, find our control loops for us. It eliminates um, this idea of interaction. So let me talk a little bit more about interaction. Uh, this is a concept we need to be very comfortable with when, uh, when talking with other control engineers. And so I'm going to look at that in this context that I'd asked you to consider over the weekend. Remember, I had left this problem for you in class where I said consider two flows coming in. I call that V5 and V6. So you've got two valves over there. And let's, let's make this uh, concise. Uh, refer to something that you're familiar with. Uh, let's call this uh, flow rate naphthalene. And let's call this flow air. And these two streams are being mixed. And we're going to send this to a chemical reactor. And the two things that are of interest to us in that reactor are the flow rate going into the reactor, as well as the composition. Okay, we're interested in those two quantities. And I'd asked you to think how you might pair those two control loops. How will you control F7? What will you manipulate? How will you control A7? What are you going to manipulate? Any suggestions on that? Take a minute to plan. Talk with the person next to you. This is an interesting one. It's, it's, there's a bit of a subtlety over there. It's deceptively simple.
Any suggestions on this one? Any options we should be considering here? Should they? Okay. Okay, so there's this idea that we need to control ratio and we need to control um, the flow, total flow. Um, let me back up on that, that. I'm going to just clarify the controller objectives. The controller objectives are to control composition, so percentage naphthalene and percentage flow. We're assuming that, that when the operator sets the value that she or he would like for A7, they've taken into account the ratio. So they've figured out what ratio they want and simply saying, I want 0.35 weight percent, for example, whatever the case is. So there's your two control objectives, F7 and A7. So two control objectives, we need two manipulated variables. We have the two there. How are we going to pair them up? What's the first thing we need when we pair? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so we would want we would want to control that by naphthalene, we would want to control flow by air. Okay. So Joseph's asking I an uh, important question on the flows. So if naphthalene is a low low flow rate and air is high flow rate, then you're choosing to control flow using air, air and composition using naphthalene. So let's, let's explore that, and to do that, I've got two diagrams drawn up there. I'm going to add on the flow rates for you. So the flow rates are as follows. Naphthalene's at 6 tons per hour, and air is at 144 tons per hour. And I'd like you to pair up those diagrams as follows, and tell me what your concerns are. So if we pair up A7 using that valve, and I'm going to pair F7 using this valve down here. Okay, so that's one control option, is to control composition with an naphthalene flow rate and flow with the air flow rate, that's the one that Joseph suggested, versus if I take those two loops and just flip them around, so now I'm controlling composition using the airflow, and I'm controlling the total flow using the naphthalene flow rate. So same control objectives, I've just flipped the loop pairing around. Do you see the issue that Joseph was referring to there? No? <coughs> yes. Okay. Let me put it in. Um, maybe. maybe so maybe you should. Sorry, your. If your naphthalene valve is fully open, then you can't control composition. Right. Okay. So that's that's a, a key point as well. We spoke about this in three P is saturation. Once your loop is saturated, your valve is fully open or fully closed. You might as well not have a control loop because you can't do anything more further on that. Okay. So we'll we'll come to that that point. This is a, assuming that you have the capability to move that flow around. Let's take a look at uh, firstly the suggested way, and then we'll look at why the opposite way around gives problems. So the suggested way here. Um, and if we put this in concrete terms, we've got 6 plus 144. That means the total flow coming out here is 150 tons per hour. So maybe put it in this, in this perspective. Assume your current flow 
F7 is equal to 140. You'd like it to be 150. So what do you change according to this diagram? What's going to have to change? How much? Air must go up by 10 extra units. So wherever air is, it has to go up by 10 units to make that match. Okay? And what you'll see when you do that is if you change air up by that certain amount, what's going to happen to A7? It's going to go drop. Okay? So you're going to have to increase this by plus 10 units in order to get that, to counteract that change. But when you do that, you fix up your flow, you get your flow now at your target of 150, but by doing so, you've also gone and messed up A7. Okay, so you fixed one problem and created another. But if we look at what's happened, the change in A7, the change in A7 has gone from 6 over 144 to 6 over 154. It's a change from 4.1% to 3.9% by weight, okay? So you've affected that A7, but by very little. And what you'll start to see is that this control loop for A7 will try to counteract that effect and open naphthalene. So it will, uh, yeah, it will open naphthalene because it wants to be at 4.1, it's gone down, so it will open this valve, which will then affect flow. Flow gets affected and changes its valve. When that valve changes for V6, it affects A7. A7, it changes V5. And you just keep doing that sort of cycle around. We looked at this in at least the students I taught for 3P. I know I showed you that diagram, how the information snakes around the block diagram. Okay? So the control loops interact. That's the terminology we use. But the interaction here is fairly minor. So you affect one loop, but by a small amount. Let's take this pairing, for example, and assume that same case. So assume that F7 is at 140. You'd like it to be at where it should be, 150. And what happens in this case now is that if your flow rate is at 140 and you'd like it to be at 150, you're going to have to open naphthalene, is what this pairing shows you. So your naphthalene changes from 6 to 16. So you go from 6 over 144 to 16 over 144. And that's a huge change. That's a change from 4% to 11%. So by fixing flow, with varying naphthalene, you inadvertently go adjust your composition, but your composition changes very dramatically with that pairing. Okay. You've created a lot more work for your control loops than to fix up. Okay, so interacting control loops are a really, really important part of troubleshooting process problems. You may be sitting here thinking, I'll never do this. I'm just going to let the control engineers do this for me. Well, that's not true, right? When you go to a company, you're going to inherit flow sheets. You're going to inherit equipment from previous engineers and their decisions. And you may not have known what their thinking was. And it may be someone that wasn't particularly skilled at doing this, that set up control loops that are always fighting each other. Okay? The moment you see that, you have to go back and look at the pairing and try to understand this sort of thinking. So don't sit here thinking that control engineers will take care of this for you. You'll, you will have to be doing this in a troubleshooting role in your future career. This, all those disturbances will, of course, also propagate further downstream and cause uh, problems for the subsequent control loops. The main reason why you don't want to do this one is because the interaction between the loops over here in this pairing is far, far greater than the interaction over there. Okay? 
So the ideal case is, of course, that you have control loops that never interact. A change in one variable never affects the others. But we see in many processes we get interaction. You get stronger interaction, as shown over here, and then very weak interaction, as shown over there. So here's the, the, ch the challenge for you then is these uh, equations are in the notes for this section, right? You'll see this example in the section, just there's no numbers in it. I've added numbers here on the board for you. I'd like you to go substitute in those numbers in the equations and calculate the relative gain array for the two cases. And you'll see the relative gain arrays show you the right pairing as well. So even if you didn't know... Um, and went through this thinking that I went through over here. Even if you just used a purely algebraic equation-based approach, you'll be able to have proven this for yourself. Okay, so that's a, the that's a challenge I'm, I'm leaving to you to think about. Any questions on this, this topic? Okay. So we've seen control loops with no interaction, control loops with some interaction. So what I'm going to move to next is um, another form of control on heat exchangers. So heat exchangers feature prominently in the flow sheet for the course project. Um, not only that, heat exchangers feature prominently in any flow sheet as a form of saving money, right? That's the prime, one of the primary reasons for, for that is energy integration. So let's take a look at, at how we control heat exchangers and I'm going to show you several case studies. We're going to look at three, three examples. And the example we're going to look at first is where you take a cold feed, pass it through a heat exchanger, and you'd like to heat it up. And we're going to use steam in this particular case. So steam over here. And because we're using steam as a utility, a utility we're allowed to go vary the flow rate. Right? You can go vary the steam flow. So variable flow is allowed. The cold feed, this is your product that you're creating. You need to heat it up you can't go vary this. Okay. I said in the prior class, you cannot generally add control loops in the path of the main products because once your process operators set the controller settings for a particular flow rate, because that's what management wants to produce by the end of the day, you can't go have that fluctuating. If someone wants to produce 80,000 tons per year, this flow has to be fixed to meet that production requirements. So that flow cannot be manipulated. Steam, because it's a utility, can be. And our goal is to control that temperature to a set point. So on that diagram, add the flexibility needed to achieve that goal. And when we say that add flexibility, we saw from Friday's class that means sensors, valves, controllers, and I'll add a new one which we're going to see today is piping. You might be able to add piping as well. Okay, suggestions for this one. Sean. You can put a valve on your steam inlet and a controller to that temperature there. 
Okay, so add a valve on the steam inlet and control it with that. So we've got, we don't add any more sensors. We've got the necessary sensor. We add that new valve, the control valve. We add a control loop, the TC. So the C part is the controller that you're adding. And we don't add any extra piping here. Okay, so this is the, by far and large, the, the most common heat exchanger configuration. Let's, um, let's switch this up a bit. So I'm going to take that cold flow now. But this can be variable. But now my hot stream this time that I'm using is a process Okay, so notice that's a process stream, it's not process steam. It's a process stream and it's fixed. Okay, so it comes from another part of the flow sheet, some other region of the flow sheet, and it crosses paths with our cold product and we exchange heat in order to heat up our cold stream here. So maybe I'll emphasize this fixed flow. OK, so again, add flexibility to that instance in order to meet the temperature controller goal over here. Perhaps talk with the person next to you if you need to on this one. And then can I ask a question of the first example? Yeah. Is it more common in real practice to put the temperature controller before or after the exchanger? Uh, after the exchanger, because that's what you're interested in controlling. Is that? Yeah, I, I, Your goal is to keep this at a fixed number. This is varying, right? So if you measured this temperature, you're just, you're, you, you're just like trying to apply feed forward in some way, I think. Yeah. yeah. But you'd have, no, it's not typically done. Um, because you'd have to have perfect or close to good knowledge of, no, of the knowledge of the heat transfer and the losses, right? Yeah, so you have to have a good model to try and predict. But if you're doing all that work, you're still adding a valve, you're still adding a controller. Might as well add it here, and then feedback. Remember, will always get you to set point, right? With as long as you got the integral mode there, you can get back to set point. Okay, suggestions for this particular configuration where we can't go vary this flow anymore. Mark. Okay, so put our valve on the cold stream. and a controller there. Will this work? Rachel? You need to know a bit about the heat transfer going on here in order to find out this temperature. Oh, of this, this street. Oh, okay, you need to know a bit about that outlet temperature. No, this, our, sorry, our, let me rephrase. Our goal is to control this cold, this cold stream needs to be heated to a certain value. Okay, yeah. So, um, so let's be clear on that. Cold stream needs to be heated to a certain value. Mark's suggestion is manipulate the flow coming in, presuming we're allowed to, and I've told you we can. Brandon? It's fine as long as you can assume the process stream coming in remains the same temperature. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Let's say the process stream temperature is at a certain value. 
t, and now it goes up. What's going to happen here in the system? So this temperature rises. What happens in the heat exchanger? Okay. Okay, so this, this temperature rises, and then what's going to happen back here? Open or closed? Open. Okay, so we let more cold in. So that seems to work, at least on paper, right? And the converse would also work the other way around. If this temperature dropped, we would sense that temperature lowered over here, and we would close that valve, putting less cold, cold stream in. So it seems to work, right? And it, that is true, it does work, it's just not typically done. This configuration isn't the most common configuration, and the reason for that is we usually don't vary the flow of our process stream. Remember that idea I said to you just earlier? Our feed stream, our, our process stream, we typically don't manipulate it, uh, or at least put co control loops in the path of it. Okay. Process stream. This is also a process stream. Like this is a another your cold naphthalene, for example, that you want to heat up. Okay. So yeah, there can be cases where you've got two process streams crossing. Okay. So but let's assume that we've got one process stream that we can vary and one process stream we cannot vary. This configuration will work. It's just we don't see it very typically. Let's go back to Mark's idea now. What if this is a process stream that's fixed flow, and this is a process stream that's fixed flow. So uh, let's get a picture going. So we now need to control that temperature. This is a process stream that's cold. We cannot manipulate its flow. Coming in, we're going to exchange heat with another process stream elsewhere on the flow sheet. We're going to cross paths through a heat exchanger. But for the same reason, this one is a fixed flow. We cannot vary. So we've got this requirement, two really good streams, a cold stream that needs to be heated. On the other side of our flow sheet, we've got a hot stream that needs to be cooled. Seems like a perfect match but neither of them can manipulate their flows. Can we, can we add flexibility here? I want you to think about it for a minute. How would you plan that process? This is, a, this is some good thinking that you can discuss with the neighbor next to you, and then we'll take a bit of a discussion. Okay, suggestions. Adam? You add a bypass stream and cross the exchange on the cold side, and then you add a valve on that bypass to control it. Okay, so a bypass around the cold stream. Let me do it up this side, rather. So bypass coming around over into here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Paid with the temperature. Okay, so I'm going to put it here. Okay. So that's one suggestion. Any other thoughts on that? Clear? Instead of a bypass, can you do a recycle? Yeah, that could be considered. 
Yeah, I want, so a recycle would be something like, take it back over here, okay? Interesting suggestion, I want you to go simulate that in Aspen and see what happens, okay? Brandon? A level control, okay, to vary the contact area. Okay, so there's an interesting concept. Some heat exchangers, we can vary the contact area. If the coils are submersed, half in liquid, half not in liquid, you can vary the level and adjust the amount of area. But to adjust level, how would you adjust? To adjust level, you need to have a valve somewhere. And if you vary the, that flow, then you're varying this flow and you're violating this constraint, okay? But um, an interesting idea is we do see that in some heat exchangers, that level is the, the mechanism to control the temperature. So this, um, coming back to this one, that's, that is the, the desired, desirable way to control this temperature when you cannot vary the flow. Putting a bypass around it does not alter the flow coming in or the net flow leaving. The bypasses connect and the total flows recombine again. So total flow doesn't change. Let's just um, think about it. I said in the prior class on Friday, when we make our control loop pairings, two things we look for are no or very little time delay. And secondly, we look for very fast dynamics. Okay, conversely, we don't want time delay and we don't want slow dynamics. We want no time delay and we want fast dynamics. So do we meet those two criteria with this particular setup? Time delay, do we see any significant sources of time delay here? No, very little time delay, right? You measure the temperature over here and any change made to the valve in terms of the dynamics, you make a change here to the valve, immediately the flow increases or decreases Mixing is pretty much instantaneous at a T-junction, and provided this temperature sensor is not geographically far away, so we don't see that on a PNID, we don't see distances on a PNID, but you wouldn't put this temperature hundreds of meters downstream from the mixing point. You'd put the temperature very close by so that you reduce your time delay, right? So this is your time delay theta over there. Remember though, from process control, you had e to the minus theta s in your transfer functions representing time delay. No time delay means you want to put that sensor very close to the mixing point. This setup has incredibly fast dynamics. You open the valve and very quickly a change in flow occurs causing a change in temperature due to instantaneous mixing. In fact, this is a much more responsive control loop than any of the other ones I drew previously. If you take a look at this diagram, if we make a change here in the flow, what is the time before we see it here at the sensor? What are the, what are the restrictions in our path? The heat exchanger, right? And a heat exchanger, we've got these banks and banks of tubes in, in hairpin shapes. So the time taken for a change here in the valve before you see it at the sensor is actually longer. So this bypass configuration is, is a lot more responsive. So let's um, perhaps summarize some of, some of these topics. When we're looking for control loops, we'll just wrap up the section. So requirements for control loop pairing. There's several elements we look for, and first is, is safety. Okay? You want a safe pairing, and the first way to enforce safety is, well firstly, no positive feedback. Okay, and what I mean by positive feedback is you don't go set a controller gain that goes and does the opposite of what it should be. Remember the controller gain should always match the sign of the gain of the valve. Right? So here we saw that if this temperature was too high, we would close or open this valve. 
this temperature is too high, what do you go do to this valve? Open it, okay? So a control loop with positive feedback would do the opposite. This temperature was too high, it would close the valve. And then you set up uh, the opposite effect. The, the control loop becomes unstable. Okay, so safety is ensured by ensuring you tune your control loop properly, and that's uh, something that the control engineer will do. The other way we do this is pair appropriately on the RGA elements. Okay, so if you go look back at Dr. Marlin's notes or Seaborg's notes, if you used Seaborg, is there's rules on pairing with RGA and negative pairing is never desirable and can lead to unsafe operation. Okay, so we ensure safety by those two, two approaches. Then the next ones are all related to economics and making our process flexible. There are, you're going to pair based on fast dynamics. Okay, so if you can choose one control loop configuration over another, you'd pick the one that has the faster dynamics. That means you get to set point faster, it improves the quality of the product that you're making. You can eliminate disturbance faster. So that's, that's an obvious one. Um, also, no or little delay, that goes actually hand in hand with the fast dynamics because we learned in 3P4, um, very importantly, that any delay that you have, you have to detune your controller. You have to reduce the aggressiveness of your controller if there's long time delays. And when you reduce the aggressiveness of your controller, you're producing off-spec product for a longer duration. You're reducing the quality of your product. So again, it plays into economics over there. So as Dr. Marlin said in the prior class, you notice that safety ranks first, and we work hard at that until we get that right. Everything else is economics after that. Okay. Some of the other aspects we look for are linearity and symmetry. Let me just quickly explain what those two are and then it's finished. The reason why linearity is so important for us is when we open a valve, so this might be percent open, and this might be the temperature on the outlet, linearity refers to the fact that that response is mostly linear. We can tune the control loop a whole lot easier for that because it says it doesn't matter if the valve is mostly closed or mostly open, the change in the response is roughly the same. Remember the whole of process control was about deviation variables and changes. Right? So a linear response means that any change at low percent opening has the same e effect at high percent opening. That's not true if, for example, your curve looked something like this. Okay. If your curve looked something like that, it says here when your valve is closed, you get a very, very high or sharp change for deviations down here. And then here, when you open your valve, you get almost no change. Right? That control loops don't like that. They work very, very poorly when you've got that sort of response curve. So linearity and symmetry says if you open your valve and you get this profile, say in orange, the last thing you want to have is if you close your valve, that you get something like this happening, coming back in red. Okay? So this is a non-symmetrical valve. You open your valve and it does one thing, you close your valve and it does another. Okay, that again will upset control loops. We call that hysteresis. So in order of, of economics, these things are what matter. And safety is, of course, always first. Okay, so in the next class, um, I'll post a new set of notes for Wednesday that will, will show up on the website later today, and we'll look at that topic on Wednesday's class.